Up next on The Reveal. Failure to treat. A Georgia veteran dies while in the care of a licensed outpatient drug treatment program. The state needs to investigate, like thoroughly investigate. So we did. Christine, do you have a second? It almost makes you afraid to send your kids to school. Uh, these are threats that you cannot ignore. How Georgia schools are using high technology to keep their campuses safe. Then why spend all this money? Why do all this? I think we're protecting our most valuable assets. A fight over the right to see Georgia's constitution is now headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's the people that own the law, and it's the people that own the legislature. From our Midtown studios in Atlanta, the reveal begins right now with our multi-Emmy and National Murrow Award-winning team of investigators. Welcome to the reveal. I'm Brendan Keith. And I'm Faith Abube. In the next few weeks, Georgia's governor will convene a special commission it will be tasked with improving the care of people suffering from substance abuse. Advocates want more oversight into drug treatment programs because they believe some often do more harm than good. One Atlanta family says it cost them their brother's life. It's a military honor for a man who served his country, who lived a life far from easy. Deep down inside, I, you know, I, I always waited on that call. When Stephen Nibbs got out of the Navy more than 20 years ago, he moved in with his brother Melvin in Atlanta. He soon noticed Stephen acting strange. We would just be sitting down and it's like, you know, the voice is going on in his head. And he's always paranoid, going to the window and stuff. To quiet the noises, Stephen self-medicated with drugs, especially crack cocaine. Amelia Jackson oh, wow. is Stephen's sister. He has schizophrenia. One moment he will want to be himself, and the next minute he want to be Tina Turner or somebody, you know. So that's how I kind of put two and two together, and I understood that, okay, he's really suffering mentally. When Stephen's siblings couldn't care for him anymore, he landed on the streets of Atlanta homeless. That's when he met this woman. Christine Yako Richards. She runs a state licensed outpatient drug treatment program called Agape Community Integrated Health Systems. Its website says Agape provides counseling, case management, and medical care for the homeless and those suffering from mental health issues. According to records reviewed by the reveal, Stephen was a client of that program. Stephen? Here's Christine speaking at Stephen's funeral. I looked beyond these challenges. I know that his challenges are trying his best. Stephen's family say Christine cared for him for 15 years. But during that time, instead of seeing their brother get better, they say he appeared to get worse. She's also supposed to make sure that he is in a living, safe situation, and none of that was going on. This is the apartment complex where Stephen's siblings say their brother lived. It's run by a company called Gift Transitional Home, also owned by Christine. According to city records, Atlanta police have responded to this address at least 137 times since 2014 for allegations involving rape, burglary, and suicide. Everyone was doing drugs. Yeah. He, Every time I w went to visit him. They're right there doing drugs. The last time they saw their brother alive was July 22, 2018. Panhandling at the intersection Peyton Road and MLK Drive. The next day, an alleged drug driver hit and killed Stephen. What he'd been through, he didn't have to go through that. The state needs to investigate, like thoroughly investigate. Three months after Stephen's death, the state did investigate. According to records from the Georgia Department of Community Health, the state cited Agape with dozens of violations, including failing to conduct treatment plans, drug screens, and not doing psychosocial assessments of its clients. Agape never did respond to those violations, never gave the state a correction plan either. Turns out they didn't have to. Why? Because it moved office locations from here to just a few miles away. And after a reinspection, the state gave it a clean slate and a new license. It makes no sense at all. And yet, sadly, it's something that I've seen 
with other facilities as well. Heather Hayes is a licensed counselor in Georgia and a nationally known interventionist. She believes the state's current oversight of drug treatment programs isn't enough to keep people safe. There's no monitoring, there's no regulation. So programs will come in, they'll have one inspection when they open, and that's it. There's no follow-up inspection unless someone makes a complaint. And so how can you even begin to take care of vulnerable clients and their families if you don't have that in place? Earlier this year, Georgia created a commission to look for ways to improve mental health and substance abuse treatment. State Representative Kevin Tanner founded it. How does the state make sure that these private facilities are doing what they're supposed to if they're not inspecting on a regular basis? I think having proper oversight is extremely important. And depending on the type of facility, depending on the relationship between the state and that facility, there's a whole host of, of various ways the state could be, uh, be involved. And maybe that means additional oversight. During Stephen's funeral, Christine praised her former client and the work she did for him. Stephen managed what he a year later, she wasn't so eager to speak about Stephen or her company when we had questions. After not responding to our calls and letters, we showed up outside her office in College Park a few weeks ago. Hey, Christine. Christine, it's, do you have a second? I just want to talk about Stephen Nibs. Driving away from questions about a client she once cared for that some believe didn't get the help he needed to survive. Andy, the owner drove away from you, so did you ever get a response? You know, a short time after that interaction, their attorney emailed me to say Stephen never received drug abuse counseling at Agape. What about that state violation? Any response? They say the state violations had to do with a filing and human resources issue, nothing to do with patient care. Coming up on The Reveal. That will stand as a deterrent because they know we're watching. And it also gives us the ability to react and respond. How new technology is keeping students safe. Welcome back to The Reveal. When it comes to shootings in school, 2018 was one of the worst on record. A troubling statistic that has not gone unnoticed by Georgia lawmakers who have approved $85 million over the next two years to make schools safer. It's taxpayer money being spent to fund high tech tools and common sense basics. But will it keep our children safe? It doesn't take a mass shooting to know the threat of violence is real. Officials tell us a suspect was found to have a weapon and was arrested. Only two months into the school year, police have arrested three students at different Cobb County high schools. One is accused of actually having a loaded 9mm handgun on campus. You have to like hide and get down. And in DeKalb, fears of a gun on campus locked down two different schools as police investigated before making the arrests. It almost makes you afraid to send your kids to school. Uh, these are threats that you cannot ignore. But Shannon Flonore, the head of Fulton County Schools safety team, admits every district has different tools to combat those threats. Here, it is analytics, cameras with artificial intelligence. Uh, you came into this facility, and whether you realize it or not, when you walked in here, our system tagged you. You walk a certain way, you have certain features about yourself. His team can then search for that person to find everywhere they have been on campus. Think of it like Google. We ran one search where all we could see was the back of a woman wearing a purple shirt. And there, there you go. Is, walking into the building. <laughs> and at this point. Now you've got a face. Yeah. The analytics are so good, it can detect she's there even when the human eye cannot. That's all the way to the end of the hall and it's, it knows that's her. Give it another six months, um, it'll do gun detection. If we catch it on camera, it'll alert us. Fulton County paid for the system with a voter approved SPLOS, but it is an example of the type of technology other schools have requested funding to install using state grant money. For Fulton County schools, it equates to about $3.4 million. That's why Flonori says they're using the grant money first to conduct a survey of every single school. Then in November, they'll use the rest to fill the identified gaps. Maybe from a fence that needs to be 
enhanced or repaired. Um, it could be restriping of a, of a parking lot. It could be additional signage. We reviewed all of the grant requests from Metro Atlanta schools and found invoices for roll-up security blinds and classroom lockdown kits to include things like temporary toilets and food rations. One school wants key fobs because there are several doors to the outside of the building continually propped open. Forsyth County has used the money to build or upgrade guest entrances. And Paulding plans to install security film on glass windows. Code red, total school lockdown. In Cobb County, the grant money will install campus alert systems in 70 elementary and high schools. Clayton County says it's also researching vendors hoping to do the same. To give the teachers an immediate ability to notify the entire school and the entire district if we have a situation. But Thomas Trawick, who had safety and security for Clayton County Schools, says his first focus is keeping weapons out of the schools. He's used grant money to purchase six portable metal detectors. We want to have the ability to go to different schools to conduct safe school checks, uh, random checks. The metal detectors are only active in the morning. And last school year, a student hit a gun outside until the coast was clear. I'm going to be quite honest with you. There is no foolproof method in keeping a weapon off any campus. But Trawick says he is still going to try by putting eyes in the sky as well. And we're going to use it for arrivals, dismissals, during lunch periods, and doing athletic activities. The district is still working through the logistics, so we sent up our drone to see how a bird's eye view might offer an advantage. That will stand as a deterrent because they know we're watching, and it also gives us the ability to react and respond. That's why Clayton County has purchased 30 drones, one for every middle and high school that is not too close to the airport's flight path. Had it not been for this money, do you think you would have been able to make this purchase? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It seems every school can use something. Yet according to the Department of Education, seven districts in Metro Atlanta haven't submitted a single invoice. Most say they're still considering options. But even without drones, cameras and alert systems, districts say classrooms are safe. So then why spend all this money? Why do all this? I think we're protecting our most valuable assets, and that's our youth. And, you know, and that's our future. Has Clayton County used any of those drones yet? Not yet, because as you can imagine, there are a lot of safety and legal concerns, especially when you want to fly these so close to people. Remember, they want to use them before school and at football games. That and Clayton County, this is the first district that I can find trying to do anything like this. So they're truly writing the playbook on this one. If you want to see how your child's school is spending the money, log on to 11alive.com. We've created a searchable database that lists all of the invoices submitted thus far. Next on The Reveal. In America, the law isn't owned by governments, it's loaned by the people. How a dispute over Georgia's constitution will be decided by the highest court in the land. Would you like to see the laws of the state of Georgia? Well, you need to spend nearly $400 just to buy a copy. One man tried to fix that and Georgia lawmakers sued him. Now the investigation you're about to see is headed to the U.S. Supreme Court. These are the Georgians who make the law, but do they own it? The General Assembly is suing this man in federal court because he dared to publish all 50 volumes of Georgia law online for free. America is based on the idea of an informed citizenry because ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you don't know what the law is, you can't obey it, but also you can't change it. Carl Malamud's publicresource.org is the defendant in the copyright infringement lawsuit filed by the General Assembly. In America, the law isn't owned by governments, it's loaned by the people because it's the people that give authority to the government to operate. The people own copyright on the law. These 50 volumes make up the OCGA, the official code of Georgia annotated. 
fact, the state's official law books contain all the legislative acts, plus public court cases and attorney general opinions. Lawmakers claim putting those annotations together amounts to a creative work, one the state has copyrighted. There's only one law in Georgia. It's the official code of Georgia annotated. Every act in the Georgia Assembly begins an act to amend the official code of Georgia annotated. The 11 Alive investigators asked to inspect the law books under a measure contained within them, Georgia's Open Records Act. The Legislative Council denied our request, suggesting the law is available at many libraries. We had trouble finding the law at three local branches, including the Central Library in Georgia's capital city. There's a set at the Public Law Library directly across from the state capitol, but cameras aren't allowed inside without an order signed by a judge. Atlanta's main library keeps its copies out of sight in a back room where we had to request special access to photograph the volumes some six years out of date. It just doesn't make sense in an internet era to say you need to travel 30 miles to the county seat to look at the 50 volumes of paper and that somehow is making the law accessible to you. It isn't. The Legislative Council wrote we could purchase the law for $378 like anyone else but warned us not to publish Georgia laws on 11alive.com. The OCGA is, quote, copyrighted by the state of Georgia and shall not be republished without permission. No such permission is granted here. That response reflects every attempt we've made to get documents from state legislators. Transparency means we get to see government documents from every agency, from the dog catcher to the governor. But the Legislative Council always replies, your request is denied. Were you aware the General Assembly is exempt from the Open Records Act? I was not, no. Were you aware that the General Assembly is exempt from the Open Records Act? I did not know that. But ask to see any documents from a legislator, and you'll hear from their lawyer, a lawyer you're paying. What is this about? About transparency, like open records, things like that. I'd rather not. Part of my concern is I'm a governor's floor leader, and so I don't want to... Um, I want to make sure that I'm answering questions consistent with what the administration would want me to. And I, since I don't know what the question, if you want to give me the questions, I'll be happy to. So you want the questions in advance? Here's how lawmakers avoid questions about their documents. The General Assembly is not an agency under its own Open Records Act. The legislature led itself off on a technicality. One few lawmakers are interested in fixing. If it ever came up for a vote that the General Assembly would be subject to the Open Records Act, would you be in favor of that? Um, I just have to look at the legislation. You know, the, the devil is in the details. If you want to give me the topic matter, I'll be glad to. Unfortunately, i got to run in, in here as well. This is a public building, isn't it? Yeah. When they saw our cameras, Legislative Council staff was sure to draw the blinds to prevent the public from seeing the keeper and defender of the legislature's secrets. It's the people that own the law. And it's the people that own the legislature. We are all servants um, of the people when we are in public service, and we just can't forget that. Since we first investigated this story in 2016, Georgia won its lawsuit, but that was overturned by the 11th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, which said Georgia's annotated code is the law which belongs to the people. So this story, this investigation is actually part of the Supreme Court case? Yes, Faith. The state is arguing that its annotated code is easily and readily available, something we disproved in our investigation. And this email from the Legislative Council here in Georgia saying we couldn't republish the law without their permission will actually be an exhibit presented to the justices in December. Next week on The Reveal, up to 1 million Marine Corps veterans potentially exposed to contaminated water on a military base. It makes me want to cry. I didn't uh, ask for this. I didn't do anything wrong. The federal government admits the chemical exposure. So why is it denying veterans their claims for health benefits? Thanks for watching The Reveal, the nation's only weekly local investigative show. We'll see you next Sunday for The Reveal.